Well, good evening, friends. Good evening. I greet you this beautiful evening in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made, and with, with what's left of it, let us therefore rejoice and be glad. And why don't you stand up together? Good evening. My name is Andrew Forrest. I'm the senior pastor here. Welcome to Asbury. At Asbury, we believe that God has more for everyone. We're going to push into what God has given us tonight. Now, here, here's a question off the top. Does God, from before the beginning, does God predestine, to use a theological word, some people for belief in salvation and other people for unbelief and, and condemnation? That's a question. It's an important question. And we're going to get to that question by looking at four different questions that the Apostle Paul is looking at tonight in chapters 9 through 11 of his great letter to the Romans, namely this. Why did so many Jews miss Jesus Messiah? Secondly, in light of the fact that so many of the Jews were turning away from Jesus and so many of the Gentiles were turning toward him, was it the case that God had replaced the Jews with the Gentiles as his chosen people? What is going to be the fate of unbelieving Jews? And in light of all this, Paul is wondering, what is God up to anyway? And by looking at these four questions as we look through Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, it's going to give us a better way to understand about our responsibility and God's sovereign hand working in history. So I'm glad you're here, and I know we may have a lighter crowd tonight. Maybe it's some storms out, or it's been real windy, and I know we, none of us have time to be here, but we're here. And we're going to use this time to dig into God's Word, and our prayer is that God uses it to kind of bring us more alive and give us joy and peace and believing. So with all that in mind, why don't you turn to your neighbors and just say, good evening. I'm glad to see you tonight. Shake a hand. Now, y'all have probably heard me say this many times. What age is it that you get when you start repeating yourself all the time? Because I'm well past that age. <laughs> but as long as I live, I'm just going to tell you, I'm never going to take again for granted the opportunity to come to church and be with other people. After the pandemic, I'm never going to take a night like this for granted. I'm so grateful to be here with you and see you together. We're going to sing. This is a great hymn. God of grace and God of glory. Now, if you're not awake yet, this hymn is going to wake you up. Listen to these words. Verse 1. God of grace, and we put it on the screen, guys. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thine ancient church's story, bring her bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. Keep going. Lo, the hosts of evil round us scorn thy Christ to sail his ways. Fears and doubts too long have bound us. Free our hearts to work in praise. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the living of these days. Cure thy children's warring madness. Bend our pride to thy control. Shame our wanton, selfish gladness. Listen to this. Rich in things and poor in soul. That'll preach, won't it? Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. And then it comes home like this, verse four. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the search for thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore. Isn't that a great hymn? We're gonna sing it together. God of grace and God of glory. Let's sing it as James leads us tonight. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power, crown thy ancient churches for me, bring her but to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this. Oh, the face. 
wisdom grant us courage lest we miss thy kingdom's goal lest we miss thy kingdom's goal save us from resignation to the evils we deplore let us search for thy sound a great hymn that wake you up so in light of all that let's have a prayer so up Lord and do stir us up and recall us rekindle and draw us and flame and grow sweet unto us so speak through your words and use my words and the questions and the silences and our thoughts Lord to bring us more alive than you in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit amen you may be seated Now, I'm going to need some audience participation on this one. All right. I'm going to go first. Y'all are going to go second. I choose to go here. Is that fair? Maybe not. Okay. I'll give you a shot. I'll go right here. Where do y'all want to go? Tell me. Middle, okay, middle. Okay, somebody said middle. So I'm now gonna change my plan. I'm gonna go here. Where do y'all wanna go? All right, somebody said top left, so we'll do it. We'll go here. Now shoot. That's where I wanted to go. I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna go here. All right, how we doing? Where y'all wanna go? Bottom, middle, okay. Top, middle, bottom, middle. Which one? Bottom, I'm gonna say bottom, middle, okay. Well, well, shoot. What are we gonna do here? I guess, now if I, if I, do, if I do this, then it's not any fun. But, 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 did you notice something that happened each time? Each time that I went somewhere and y'all went, I then changed my plan in response to where y'all went. You see that? Like if you hadn't, if y'all hadn't done anything smart and put this there, I just would have gone check, check, check and won. Just, I would have just demolished you, you know? But you kept putting them somewhere and then I kept changing it around. So I had a plan that I wanted to implement, but the events of what happened subsequently then affected my plan. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. It's Old Testament. We're going to talk about Romans, but we're going to start with Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. Verse 1 and following. Now, this takes place around 600 BC, okay, about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And at this point, the tribe of Judah is the last of the 12 tribes, essentially, that's remaining in Jerusalem. And they have been really wayward and worshiping false gods. And the Babylonians have been breathing down their neck. And what's about to happen in a few years, we know from history, is that Babylon is gonna come, raise the walls of the city, burn the temple, ransack everything, and carry off into exile in Babylon the best and the brightest of Israelite society, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Ezekiel, etc. This hasn't yet happened, but Judah is tottering here been very, very, very uh, disobedient and, and wayward. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse one. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, arise, go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel. You all picture it in your mind, like the big guy spinning the wheel. Verse four, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. So 
God gives, the Lord gives Jeremiah an actual object lesson. He says, I want you to go look at this. And as the potter is making a thing, it goes bad and he kind of refashions it. He was trying to make a vase and he makes it into a bowl or whatever it is. Okay, now, so far, the potter has all the agency and the clay has no agency at all. The clay just responds to the potter's touch so far. But look what happens next. Verse five, then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. We're gonna pause there. God is warning Israel, watch out, watch out. I can remake you in a different way. But what happens next ought to blow your mind because look what God says. Verse seven, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. See what God is saying? God says, listen, when I have pronounced judgment on sinful people and then they turn away from sin, I am going to change my plan. Rather than bringing destruction on them, I'm going to bring blessing. Do you understand what he said so far? So we have examples of this in the Bible. I mean, maybe most famously, Jonah. So after all, Jonah runs and he's in the fish in the storm. In Jonah chapter three, verse one, Jonah walks in the city of Nineveh and says, in three days, Nineveh's going to be overthrown. And then the miraculous happens. Everybody in Nineveh repents from the king down to the, the lowest beggar and, and God relents of the disaster he was going to give on Nineveh. And Jonah gets really mad about it. That's a different lesson. But notice, notice God says, chapter six, verse seven, verse 18, and chapter, verse Chapter 18, verses seven and eight. When I've told somebody there's judgment coming and then they actually respond, I forbear, I don't bring judgment. So far, so good, but look at the next part. Verse nine. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. So I'm, I'm saying I'm for you, I have blessing, I have prosperity to come. When I said I'm gonna give good things to you. Verse 10. And if it does evil, in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. So God says, on the one hand, when folks are heading in the wrong direction and I warn them and they change, I don't bring disaster on them, I bring blessing. But when folks have heard my voice and I've promised blessing on them, but then they turn aside from the good and follow after false gods, then I will change my plan and rather than bringing blessing on them, I am going to bring destruction. Everybody understand the logic? So the, the summary, verse 11. Therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. Okay. Now, why do I spend time on the Old Testament when we're reading Romans? Because Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 quotes from the Old Testament more than any other part of the letter of the Romans. It's chock full of Old Testament allusions, including to this particular passage right here in Jeremiah 18. And if you miss the allusion and don't get Jeremiah 18, you're gonna miss everything that Paul is doing. Okay, so I have a handout. That I know it's a lot of text on here tonight because tonight is, tonight is like big boy Bible study, okay? Like put on your big boy pants, Cookies are on the top shelf you gotta reach, okay? So it's gonna be hard, but it'll be worth it. And here's the good news. We're gonna be working through these same verses over the next month. So remember your new reading guide begins on Friday. Friday, Friday, Friday. Romans chapters nine through 16. We're looking just tonight at nine through 11. And what seems to have happened in the background here is that remember, there was original small group of Jewish Christian believers in Rome. They get kicked out of Rome by the Emperor Claudius sometime after AD 41. In the meantime, while the Jews have been exiled from Rome, 
Gentiles become Christians in Rome. When the Jews are allowed to return, the Jewish Christians come back and now there are a majority of Gentile Christians in the Roman church and a minority of Jewish Christians. And the Gentile Christians kind of thought they were big stuff because after all, the gospel is increasing among the Gentiles and most of the Jews in the synagogues have shut their doors to the gospel. So Paul's got all that in mind as he starts here, chapter nine and letter to the Romans, verse one. And what I'm gonna do, we're gonna work through most of the next three chapters and I'm gonna kind of almost like translate as we go. And then we're, of course, as always, we'll end with Q&A, a long time of Q&A to kind of work where we go. So it's gonna be, it's deep water, it's a high shelf, but it's gonna be worth it. Here we go. I am speaking the truth in Christ, Romans 9.1. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Paul says, I am so grieved at the hard-heartedness of my Jewish brothers and sisters. I mean, these are the people of Abraham. The whole Old Testament is their story, how God chose Abraham, how he gave them the covenant and the law, how he spoke to them through the prophets with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he brought them out of Egypt. And they have turned aside from Jesus, the Messiah. Paul says, I, I, wish, that, I wish I could be accursed for their sake. I don't think we can possibly imagine what it must have been like for Paul to have realized that Jesus was the Messiah and then to see that so many of his Jewish brothers and sisters are not listening to the message. The question is why? Verse six. Well, it's not as though the word of God has failed. You guys, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham, because there is offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. What Paul is saying here is, yes, the Jews were the chosen people. But God has not somehow gone back on his word. And Paul says, you guys remember, of course, that not literally every biological descendant of Abraham was part of the covenant people. Ishmael is biologically descended from Abraham, but the covenant is with Isaac's line of the family. So what Paul is saying from the very top is, guys, It was never simply about biological descendants. It was always about, well, faith and promise. He he makes an even more dramatic example. Verse nine, for this is what the promise said. And he quotes from the book of Genesis, about this time next year I'll return, Sarah shall have a son. And then not only so, but when Rebecca had conceived, she had a child by one man from Isaac. And though the twins were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of the works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Paul goes, you know what? There was that one time where there were twins, but it was through one of their lines, the line of Jacob, that God decided to work, and not through the line of Esau. So Paul just says, listen, it has always been the case, you guys in the Roman church, that God kind of narrows in and works through one part of his people. So what shall we say, verse 14? Is there injustice on God's part? Is that unfair? Is it unfair that God kind of chooses one side of the family? By no means. I mean, listen, you guys know the story of Moses. He says to Moses, verse 15, I'm gonna have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now just think about our own lives, the deep mystery. Why were we born where we were born? To the parents we had. Why? Nobody determined the circumstances of his birth. Nobody picked her parents. You're just brought into this world. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that it's so important that in the church we cultivate and talk about, and young people, 
this is for you particularly, strong marriages and strong families. The reason marriage is so important is because a child doesn't get to pick his parents. And so when we use the gift of procreation outside of the covenant of marriage, children can be born, absolutely, but often they don't know who their parents are, so to speak. I don't mean literally, but it's like they don't belong anywhere sometimes. Some of us grew up with a father that wasn't present, and we know how hard that might have been in our lives, etc. That's why it's so important in the church that we have strong marriages, because children don't get to pick their parents. We're just born where we're born. Paul says that's just how God works. Verse 16. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God, who has mercy. And then Paul gives the example of Pharaoh. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Okay, let's pause there. We studied Exodus earlier in the spring. There's some Bible studies online, you can look at that. In fact, there's one in which we talk at length about Pharaoh and his hard-heartedness. It's actually a very complicated picture in Exodus. Sometimes Pharaoh hardens his heart. Sometimes it says Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And sometimes God hardens Pharaoh's heart. So which is it? And the answer is yes. It's a deep mystery in how God works in a person's life. If we take this one verse out of context, it might seem that God has deliberately set Pharaoh up to unbelief, and then therefore come into destruction. Now, as we work all the way through 9, 10, and 11 in these chapters, we're gonna see that actually the the overall picture is a little bit different than that. So you gotta keep going. But what we'll just say so far is Paul is just beginning to lay out the terms of his argument. Has God rejected the Jews as his chosen people? Why are so many of the Jews rejecting Jesus? What happens to unbelieving Jews? What is God up to? And Paul is just starting out by saying, listen, God has always worked in different ways with different people. And even Pharaoh, even Pharaoh, who refuses to let the people go, God even uses Pharaoh as part of his sovereign plan. So Pharaoh's refusal becomes part of God's plan of salvation. Verse 19. Okay, smart guy, you will then say to me, well, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Paul anticipates some Roman interlocutor saying to him, well, if God is just at work in this mysterious way, and if God even uses people who refuse him for his purposes, well, how is that fair? How can God possibly hold us accountable? And here's where Paul goes, are you kidding me? Verse 20, you really wanna say that? Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? He's quoting from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use, like in worship in the temple, and another for dishonorable use, like for feeding your donkey? What if God, verse 22, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, verse 24, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Okay. All I want to say is this. Remember the reference to Jeremiah, which is definitely in the background here in Romans. Jeremiah says, God will change his plan depending on whether people trust him and believe or are distrustful and don't believe. God will change his plan. What Paul is saying here so far is listen, 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 listen. Yes, Abraham's people were God's chosen people. But if there are people in Abraham's family who had hard hearts toward God, God can turn and now bring in the Gentiles if he wants That's God's prerogative. He can do it. He is the potter, so to speak. We are the clay. And depending on how we play the board, God will respond either with mercy or with judgment. And then Paul goes on to say, listen, this was always in the Old Testament, verse 25. Like it says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I'll call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you're not my people, There they will be called sons of the living God. What Paul is doing here is he's quoting from the Old Testament prophets 
And he's just saying, guys, yes, it's kind of strange at first that the Gentiles are now part of the people of God. They've been brought in. But actually, when you go back and look at the Old Testament, God was always planning on bringing in the other people. He was always planning on doing this. That was his plan from the beginning. Remember, Paul has this long, complicated argument. We're working our way through it. But it's, why are the Jews not believing in Jesus Messiah? And why are the Gentiles believing? Has God changed his plan? Did God change what he said to Moses? Is God a liar? Can you not count on the Lord? And Paul's saying, nope, 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 nope. Isaiah cries out, verse 27, concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them shall be saved. The Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we'd have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. He just says again, listen, even in the Old Testament, it said not everybody in Israel was going to believe. It's always been there. The prophets always saw that was the case. Some people were faithful and many others weren't. Verse 30. Which is how we say then. Y'all listen to this, Paul's saying. This is crazy. Those Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. The Gentiles didn't know about the law of God. They didn't have Mount Sinai. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. But now when they heard about Jesus Messiah, they've trusted him. So they're righteous by faith, a major theme of Romans. But Israel, verse 31, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, they had the Ten Commandments, they have the covenant. They didn't succeed in reaching that law. Well, why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. End of chapter nine. Paul says, the Gentiles, they trusted Jesus, and now they're part of God's family. Remember, there's one family of God, and the way you become part of that family, we shall see, is through trust in Jesus, Messiah. The Gentiles, who didn't have Moses, they didn't have the Ten Commandments, they didn't have Mount Sinai, they didn't have Isaiah, they didn't have the prophets, the Gentiles, when they hear that Jesus was crucified and raised, raised again to new life, the Gentiles go, I believe. And now they're in part of God's family. Whereas many people in Israel, many of the Jews, who had the law and the prophets and should have known better, when Jesus came, you know what he was like? Look, look, watch, watch, watch. Jesus was a stumbling block. They tripped over him. They couldn't understand a crucified Messiah a baby born in a manger, a gentle, lowly soul who eats with tax collectors and sinners, who is then crucified in their place. It messed with their categories. He was a stumbling block. And Paul says that's why they missed it. They had the wrong idea about what Jesus was supposed to be like. And they missed it. We're just getting going. Here we go. Now chapter 10. Paul says, hey, verse 1, chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Jews is that they would be saved. For I bear them witness, verse two, they do have a zeal for God. Like, they are passionate, but not according to knowledge. They're ignorant. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. I miss Jesus. Four, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul says, the Jews were all concerned about the little pieces of the law. This is, okay, you, you remember how Jesus is always getting arguments with the Pharisees, for example? They're always angry. Like, he heals somebody on the Sabbath. He heals somebody on the Sabbath. And they get angry that somebody is healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus goes, you guys, you're totally missing the point. You, you think the Sabbath is what matters more than the healing of a human body? You're not understanding. You're, you're like, you're missing the forest for the trees, so to speak. Verse five, Moses says, Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. Moses, Moses said, yes, 
The person who does the commandments shall live by them. If you follow the law, you're gonna have life. Moses said that. We are now jumping in. This is our third Bible study in Romans. We're in chapter 10. There's been nine chapters before this. But Paul has been explaining that the Jewish law couldn't work because the hearts of the people were bad. And so having the right law but having a bad heart isn't enough. By the way, this is why we must pray for spiritual awakening in America. Remember John Adams' famous phrase. I quoted it in our first uh, Romans part one book. That the Constitution was made for a moral people. Otherwise, they shall go through it like a whale through a net. So even having good laws isn't enough when people's hearts are bad. And that's true of God's law. So Paul has been explaining that yes, the law was good, but because the people's hearts were bad, they couldn't follow it. And Paul just says, hey guys, it was always the case the law was meant to bring life, but it didn't work. But you know what works, Paul says in verse six. The righteousness based on faith says, don't say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven, that is bring Christ down. Or verse seven, who will descend into the abyss, that is bring Christ up. Paul says, listen, when you trust in Jesus, you don't need to try to worry about like, how are we gonna get to heaven? Because Christ has already come to us. And you don't have to worry like, how, what's gonna happen to the dead people? Because Christ has already gone down to the place of the dead and brought them up with him. You just gotta trust that Jesus has done it. And here, here it is. Here it is. What does it say? Verse eight. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. And verse nine is the central verse on this entire three chapter section. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What Paul is saying here, remember he's trying to explain why the Gentiles believed and the Jews not believed. What is God up to? And Paul's just explaining, okay, this is what it means to have faith. You, look at verse nine again, confess with your mouth. So you have outward actions that you submit to and admit that Jesus is Lord. Your outward actions matched by and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So it's an inward trust in Jesus that he is who he says he is and an outward confirmation of my inward trust. That is what saving faith is. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. So if you're here tonight and you're not sure if you believe, you, never, you don't know if you're a Christian or not, that is the definition right there. Outward confession and inward trust. That is what brings you as part of the Messiah's people. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish by birth or Gentile by birth. There is one way you're saved, and this is the way. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. A little bit later, we're going to talk about this phrase that's often used. Um, uh, once saved, always saved. It's a phrase, maybe we, some of us grew up with that phrase or something. We're going to talk about that. Um, I will tell you, though, that I think verse 13 is really important if you're looking for comfort. I don't know of a single time in the Bible where Jesus refuses somebody who asks for mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. I can't think of a time where Jesus refuses to give mercy to someone who asks for it. So if you're wondering, like, oh, could I lose my salvation? The very fact that you're wondering that is proof that you haven't because you're desperate for it. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But then Paul says this, verse 14. Okay, if people have to call on Jesus to be saved, well, verse 14, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how will they hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And he quotes from Isaiah. You know what are beautiful are the feet of those who are bringing the gospel. So Paul just makes the obvious point. We gotta go and tell people about Jesus. So in our own time, God is giving us the sacred responsibility to being the messengers of the good news. So in your schools, middle school and high school students, y'all have got to be the ones that are telling people about the good news of the Lord. 
that who your friends are are not defined by what clothes they wear or what other people say about them or whether how tall or short they are or good at sports they are or how pretty they are. It doesn't matter. What matters is putting faith in Jesus. And they're not gonna know that unless you tell them. They're not gonna know that from TikTok. They're not gonna know from listening to the music they listen to. You're gonna have to tell them. And beyond that, Asbury, I think God is giving us a large platform. We have money in the bank. God is giving us, he's blessing us because he wants us to do something with his blessings. We're, 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 on a, we're on a great track financially, for example. So we are um, about 6.6% 6 .6 of where we were last year, year to date. Last year we had a record financial year, by the way. We're 6.6% .6 ahead of that, which is about $550,000 ahead of where we were last year. We haven't even come through the end of the year yet. It's amazing, right? Why would God be doing that? One reason, because he wants us to do something with it. That's why. God only blesses when he expects you to use the blessing. Well, I think Asbury ought to be a sending church. There are people in the world who don't know about the gospel. And God is asking us in Tulsa, Oklahoma to go everywhere and to teach other people about it. Paul says that's what we gotta do. But bringing it back to Israel, he says, verse 16, but you know what? These Jews have not all obeyed the gospel. And then he quotes from the, the book of Isaiah, verse 18. Have they not heard? Yeah, they have. Verse 19, did Israel not understand? Yeah, they understood. But God has been saying, verse 21, all day long I have held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So Paul is saying, yes, in general, you gotta carry them gospel to places, but you know what? The Jews can't claim to have been ignorant. Paul himself was a missionary. He was going to the Jews often. And when they closed the doors of the synagogues to him, then he went to the Gentiles. That's literally how it happens. The apostles go to a synagogue, talk about Jesus, they get kicked out, and some of the Gentiles are like, um, so, uh, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> and Paul's like, really? Well, Jesus is from Israel. Okay, let me back up. Uh, God created everything. He sent his son. He died for us. You have to trust him. And the Gentiles go, absolutely, let's do it. And then the, the apostles kind of look at each other. You can imagine, they're just like, what is happening? And the Jews are hard-hearted and the Gentiles are open-hearted? So Paul's wrestling through that. Now we come to the final chapter of the argument, chapter 11. Paul goes again. I ask then, verse one, chapter 11, has God rejected his people? By no means. And Paul says, first of all, exhibit A, excuse me, I'm a Jew, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. That word is used twice in Paul's letter to the Romans here and in chapter eight, verse 29. And what it means is literally what it sounds like. The people that God's known for a long time, that he knew back in the day, that he knew beforehand. God's not rejected his people. He's known his people, he's faithful. In fact, and Paul quotes from 1 Kings about how when Elijah was the prophet, there were still faithful people, even though it didn't look at it. So there's a faithful remnant. Verse five, Paul says at the present time, there are Jews who believe. It's a remnant chosen by grace. And they didn't deserve it, but God was blessed with them. Verse seven, here we go. Well, why didn't more Jews believe? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect, those who believe, obtained it. The ones who trusted Messiah, Jesus, obtained it. The elect. But the rest were hardened, just like Pharaoh. They're not listening to God. As it is written, and then he quotes again from Isaiah, give them a spirit of stupor, eyes that won't see, ears that won't hear, down to this very day. It's like they're statues. They're not listening. And then he quotes from the Psalms. Verse 11. So, in light of all this, did they stumble in order that they might fall? In other words, did God set them up so they would miss the Messiah, so they would have to be cast into hell? Is the whole point a trap from God to really kind of trip them up? Paul says, by no means, verse 11, no. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Paul says, you know what's happening? Their hard-heartedness, God is responding to. 
God is responding to their hard-heartedness, changing his plan. And because they are hard-hearted, now God is bringing in the Gentiles. Just as God used Pharaoh's hard-heartedness as a foil to bring his people out of Egypt, now God is using the hard-heartedness of his people to bring salvation to the Gentiles. God is so powerful that he can play, you know, 5D tic-tac-toe, so to speak. No matter how people react, God is always working things for salvation. Paul goes on. Verse 13. No, he says in verse 12. So if, if their trespass means riches for the world, so if Israel's disobedience is good for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how awesome is it going to be when the Jews actually believe. Verse 13, now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Gentile Roman Christians, I'm talking to y'all now. I'm a Gentile, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, says Paul, and I magnify my ministry. Look, verse 14. In order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them, period. Okay, now listen, listen, listen. We haven't even started reading chapters 9, 10, and 11 yet. We start on Friday. This is among the most um, technical and careful part of the whole Bible. It's very difficult. So I'm gonna say a thing here that you're gonna have to go back and work through on your own. In fact, that's the point of this entire study tonight. I'm trying to give you an overview so when you read it over the next month, you can work through it. Your handout is very detailed, very specific. You can use it and study on your own. But just, I want to show you two things here, very important. Verse 14, Paul says, yeah, I am speaking to Gentiles, verse 13, verse 14, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. But I see that again. So who is Paul hoping to save by his ministry to the Gentiles? Who does he want to make jealous? Okay, more specifically, is he trying to save believing Jews or unbelieving Jews? Which is it? Unbelieving Jews, obviously. Believing Jews are already saved. He's trying to save unbelieving Jews. Everybody clear on that? Look, 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 look at the plain sense of the text. Verse 14. I'm reaching out to the Gentiles, verse 13. So in verse 14, I'm trying to make my Jew, fellow Jews jealous and save some of them. Now go back up to verse 7, chapter 11. This is very important. Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. Well, the elect obtained it but the rest were hardened. You see that? Paul says, yeah, some of the Jews believed, but others didn't. And then in verse 14, he says, and hey, you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to save the ones who have disbelieved. Okay, you see what's happening? What's happening is that those that Paul has previously described as hardened, having hard hearts, as being the non-elect, so to speak, he is further down on the exact same path it's saying, I'm trying to save those. In other words, election in the New Testament is not a permanent state. And if you are not part of the elect, you can never come to saving faith in Jesus. A hard heart is not a permanent thing that God is inflicting upon you so that you can never believe. The plain sense of what Paul is talking about here is that God has not predestined, in this case, the unbelieving Jews permanently for unbelief. It gets more interesting. Here we go. Uh, verse 17. We're going to end it on this here. If some of the branches were broken off, and you Gentiles, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. So Paul has now changed gears using a new metaphor. He's talking to the Gentile Christians in Rome. He says, imagine an olive orchard and a cultivated olive tree. And the olive dresser has been taking care of it. The original branches, some of them were snapped off. Yeah, there are people who are part of Abraham's family who because of their unbelief have been removed from the covenant people. Remember, the only mark of membership in the covenant people of Jesus Christ is faith in Jesus. That's the only mark. It's for Jews and Gentiles. 
Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. So unbelieving Jews have been broken off from God's covenant people. And believing Gentiles have been grafted in. They have been kind of put in and there's a way, I'm not, a, I'm not an arborist, but there's a way that you can take a healthy branch from another thing and you graft it in and over time, the sap and it all grows together. Paul says you Gentiles have been taken from like a wild olive tree and you've been brought in and you've been put right back into the living root. But don't get arrogant. Don't get arrogant, verse 18. Don't you think you're better? You Roman Christian Gentiles, you Gentile Roman Christians, you're not better than the Jewish people. If you are, verse 18, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Remember, it's Abraham's people who are the original covenant people because they trusted. But then you might say, verse 19, well, you know what? Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Verse 20, yeah, that's true. Look, 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 look. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Have a sense of awe and reverence, like standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Like you don't fool around with this thing. You've got to go, whoa. Verse 21. I want everyone to look at this. This is very important. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then, verse 22, the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you. Provided you continue in his kindness Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Whoa. Let's pause right here. Now, friends, I'm being a little polemical tonight because often chapters 9, 10, and 11 have been really a key part of a certain theological system. And I respect people from that system and come from that tradition, but ultimately, I don't think their interpretation of the text is the faithful one. So I'm being a little polemical here, but I want to look at the plain sense of the text. Here we go again. Remember, he's talking to Gentile Roman Christians, and he says, don't think y'all are big stuff, because God has brought you in to the, to the living tree. Verse 21. I mean, after all, if God didn't spare the natural branches, the original people of Abraham's family, and if they didn't believe and God broke them off because of their unbelief, don't think he's going to spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God. There is consequences, severity toward those who have fallen. And there is kindness toward people who believe, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Okay. The plain sense of the text is so obvious, is it not? Y'all have your own eyes. You, you read the text yourself. The plain sense of the text is this. When you trust God, these consequences ensue. And when you turn aside from God, these consequences ensue. God has a sovereign plan. He's a tic-tac-toe, chess master, master artist, whatever the metaphor is. And Jeremiah has already told us that God is so powerful that even human freedom does not violate his plan. He can work in response to what you're doing. So, if you are saved by faith, you gotta continue in the direction that Christ is setting you. Paul would say in Romans 8, you gotta live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and set your minds in the things of the Spirit. But don't you dare think American Christian, well, you know, I, 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 went, I went to vacation Bible school as a kid and I was baptized. Don't you dare think American Christian that you can then live in complete unbelief absolute rejection of the gospel of God and say, oh, oh, no, but I'm good. I can live however I want. I can reject God, but it doesn't matter. That, that's why I say, and there's information on this on the handout, this phrase, once saved, always saved. If that's used to comfort people, I'm all for it as a pastor. If you have back, you've, you've backsliding, to use a Christian term, you've really fallen into sin and you're really, and you're really grieved by it, you can't like misplace your salvation. You can't like 
just send it away. It's like, I don't know what happened. You don't misplace it the way you might misplace your keys, all right? So don't you ever be worried about that. So I, don't want, I want you to feel confident that Christ has called you, redeemed you, has his hands on you, on the one hand. But if the phrase once saved, always saved is meant to say, you cannot walk away from the grace of God. I'm sorry, friends, and I mean this with respect. I do not understand how you can read, frankly, any part of the Bible and come to that conclusion, much less Romans 9, 10, and 11. But to even make it a little bit more interesting, I've given you a few verses here. This is the back of your handout. Look at the bottom. It's about two-thirds of the way down. This is Jesus. Matthew 10, 22. He says to his disciples, you'll be hated all, by all for my name's sake. This is Matthew 10, 22. Matthew 10, 22. But look at the end. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. He says something similar in Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are so many parables and teachings of Jesus and, so, and, and, and the entire thrust of the, the New Testament is the idea that the grace of God comes to us freely. We do absolutely nothing. We were enslaved in sin. But God has said that by condemning his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, Romans 8, 3, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, Romans 8, 4, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So Christ has set us free. He's moved us from the path of death to the path of life. But our agency is still there. And if you've been brought from death to life and then you go, you know what, forget it. I'm going back to Egypt. Ultimately, God will allow you to do that. Think about that passage from Jeremiah. When God says, I have blessings for you, and then you start worshiping false gods and rejecting me, I'm changing my plan, and vice versa. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll close here. Look how Paul ends the chapter. He says this. Verse 33, chapter 11. In light of all this, Actually, I'm going to go back and find, find all this here. Verse 25. I'm going to end, end on this note. 11:25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I don't want you to be unaware of the mystery, brothers and sisters. Yeah, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. Yeah, it looks like there's hard hearts in Israel. But this is happening until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Whatever God is doing, he's using it to bring in the Gentiles. This is why, by the way, Jesus hasn't yet returned. Because God is still trying to save people. He's trying to bring in more people. So guys, every morning you wake up in the morning and Jesus hasn't returned or the Lord hasn't called you home yet, you ought to say, thanks be to God. That means the grace of God is active and working in the world. Every single day, you flip open the television and there's some other crazy headline. Rather than focusing on the craziness of the headline, you ought to go, wow, you know what? God isn't done yet. He's still at work. It all really, really encourages us every single day. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, verse 26. And here's this beautiful, mysterious verse. Paul says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, does he mean literally every single Jewish person ever? Well, that seems hard to believe because many Jews have died in unbelief. But in somehow Paul is saying there's something, there's a big harvest that God is working towards that hasn't happened yet. And he's believing and working toward that end. Verses, verse 33, we're gonna end on this. Verse 33, we'll go to Q&A here in a second. Paul just says, in light of all this, oh, the depth of his riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or has been his counselor or who has been given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever, amen. Paul says this is deep, it's heavy. There's both a good news and a bad news side to this. The good news is this. God desires to save everyone who will believe. And as long as we have breath, it's not too late. Don't you ever give up praying for somebody. You have no idea how God is working in that person's heart. And they may be on the road, way that leads to death. But Jesus saves them and moves them on the way that leads to life. It's really encouraging. On the other hand, there's a great weight to this, isn't there? Because... 
because we have a responsibility to persevere, to continue in the direction that Jesus has set us on and that his spirit is empowering for us. So I just say to us in our church, number one, be hopeful about the state of the world, but number two, be very serious about the state of your soul in God. Be very serious. Don't you dare think that just because something happened or I'm, a, I'm an American or this or that, I can live however I want. It's not true, and it's also not too late to repent. Amen. Okay, now, I told you, I told you, I told you, I know this is heavy stuff, really heavy. I work through all of this in very slow, granular detail in our reading guides, so don't miss this. It'll be worth it. And then actually, Romans goes on after chapter 11 with some really fun stuff, which we're gonna work through in November. And I've given you this handout tonight to kind of really work through on your own. Here's my philosophy. My philosophy is, People are not leaving the faith because we're giving them too much, but because we're giving them too little, all right? So I'm trying to raise the game. The cookies are on the top shelf. It's about big boy pants and big girl pants, but I believe y'all can do it. So dig into it, and God will be with you. With all that in mind, let's go to some Q&A. Now, how it normally works is um, I defer definitely to the younger people. There may or may not be some prizes that they want or don't want. We'll see. Um, speak clearly into the microphone, try to be as concise as possible, and I promise, 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 promise we will not go later than 8 p.m. at the very latest. So where do we want to begin? We have a question. I'll come back over here, but let's start over here. And as usual, everything is fair game. Everything is fair game. Let's go. Speak right into it, sir. Would you rather tic-tac-toe or connect four? I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm actually really bad at connect four. So tic-tac-toe. I do tic-tac-toe. But you know what? Does he get a prize for that question? I don't think so. I don't think so. You got to ask a Bible question. You got to ask a Bible question. Yes, ma'am. You took us through Romans, and I'm very happy about that. But sometimes I don't have confidence in my own understanding of the scripture. Yeah. So therefore, I bring this question to you. And if I don't ask it correctly, I hope you can figure out what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. Being in the spirit of God gives us power to live the Christian life. Is accepting Christ. Say, say the first, something of what God, say the first sentence part again. Being in the spirit of God. It talks a lot about the yeah. spirit in Romans. Yes, yes, okay? yes. Is this the power for the Christian life? Yes. Is accepting Christ different than accepting the Holy Spirit? Okay, good, good question. Um, the Apostle Paul would say, no, it is the spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. He's with us. So there's not a two-stage step to belief. But if you turn to Romans 8, let's turn to Romans 8, chapter, um, verse 4 and following. No, verse 5, let's do Romans 8, 5. So no, there's not a separate thing you have to believe in to receive the Holy Spirit. Tr trust in Christ comes with it. But Paul also has no problem implying that there are people that are not living in the reality of the Spirit. For to those who, walk, those who live according to the flesh set their minds in the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds in the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind of the flesh is death, but to set the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. So Paul is implying, he's almost like he's trying to like knock the Romans outside the head and say, guys, why are you not living in the Spirit's reality? He's all around us, and you're still living like you're in Egypt. Meanwhile, the path to the promised land is right there, or something like that. Is that good so far? Is there yes a follow-up? No. Okay. Yes no. okay. There's a lot of scriptures that seem to indicate when you accept Christ, you get the fullness of Christ in you. Uh -huh. And I believe that. Yeah. But in my own testimony, I came to Christ, and years later I heard about the Holy Spirit, and yeah. then suddenly I had a desire to read the Bible, follow, uh -huh. and it's like I got a whole new, a, a new level. Yes, absolutely. And when I read in the Bible, I see that too. Yes. So is it one or the other or both? Yeah. Or the condition of your heart? So Jesus says... Um, to Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. A child is born, and then the child has to grow up. So two things are true at the same time. The moment that we trust Christ in faith, we receive the inheritance. If we are heirs with God, then co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, though we will also be glorified with him, Romans 8, 17. So it's all there. But like a child growing up or a prince growing into the responsibility of the kingdom, we have to learn and grow. So the fact that you trusted Christ for salvation, but it was only at a subsequent point in your life when you felt like an awakening, is, it's all part of the same thing. It just doesn't work in everybody's life quite the same way. Not everybody has growth spurts at the same patterns. Yeah. 
But, but the problem is, is that we've got to keep telling Christian people that God's desire is maturity and fullness and keep going, don't stop. And so many Christian people stop after they pray a salvation prayer at camp at age uh, 15. And I think for the Apostle Paul, he'd wanna run his head through the door. It would make him so angry. Guys, wake up, keep going. Is that helpful at all? Tell me your first name. Lisa. Lisa. L- Nisa with an N or Lisa? Lisa, L. L. L- L. Lisa, I have, a, I have a dessert for you. My wife made this, it just came out of the fridge. Now she was substitute teaching today and last night she said, oh my gosh, I forgot to make a dessert. So she stayed up late making this for you, Lisa. Um, Keep refrigerated, it's blueberry cheesecake dessert. So there you go. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations, great question. Very practical question. All right, let's come back over here. Who's gonna hook me up here? Okay, what do you got? Is that you, Bonnie? Yeah. Okay. So this isn't really related to your sermon tonight, but um, what are some like good um, verses or scriptures you can look towards while you're feeling doubtful or unsure of yourself while growing up as a Christian in high school? Do you mean I'm feeling doubt, all right, Bonnie is the question, I'm feeling doubtful about my faith or I'm just like questioning myself. I'm just not feeling like, like I have what I need. The latter? Yes. Yeah, okay, so turn to Philippians chapter one, verse six. This is a beautiful thing that Paul has referenced in Romans 8, 29 and 30 as well. Philippians is a little letter of the New Testament, Philippians 1, 6. Um, This is exactly what it is, Bonnie. Bonnie, I'm gonna speak this over you. I know this is true about you. Philippians 1, 6. Paul says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, Lisa, this goes to your question as well. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul says to the Philippians, hey, 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 you may not be, have perfectly matured into the fullness of Christ now. And you may be in high school and you're like, I don't know if I have what I need and this is difficult or whatever. Paul says, no, no, no. God who started the thing in you, Bonnie, he's gonna be faithful all the way to the end. He's not gonna quit. You just gotta also hang on to him. He's hanging on to me and I'm hanging on to him. So Philippians 1, 6 is an example. In Romans, Romans 8, 29 and 30 is the exact same point. Paul says, those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8, 29 through 30, Bonnie, is another way of saying that. So you gotta keep, hold on, he's, gonna, he's not done with you. Hey, Bonnie, I heard somebody say one time that as long as you have breath, God's not done with you yet, okay? <laughs> so I got something for you here, my friend. Now, I was there when we bought some of these gifts. And we went to a, a um, let me just say, it wasn't Reesers where we went to as a supermarket, okay? This is aloe vera dessert. I don't really know what, hey, this is good news. Chill before serving, okay? There you go. Slurp that up. Over here, Miles, yes, sir. Why does, go ahead, you're fine, Miles, you did great. We like hearing you. Speak with a good voice, that's great, man. Okay. That just sounds so weird. It's good, though, it's good. We want to hear you. Why does God, I sound so weird, I can't, I can't do it. Do you wanna just tell me up here? Do you yeah. wanna just tell me up here? <laughs> so Miles' question is, why does God use the pottery example? Um, two reasons, Miles, I think. One is that they just knew a lot about pottery because every, They couldn't go to the store and buy dishes. They had to make their own dishes in their own villages. So everybody would know about it. So God was using an example that everybody knew about. Well, number two, because the clay is manipulated by the potter. So God is trying to show that he's really in charge. That's part of the reason why. Does that make sense at all? Is that helpful? Thank you for being brave and asking a question. And I got a gift for you here. Uh, This, uh, now, So our gifts have become known in the community. So people are now unloading on me the gifts that they don't want to have. This is one of them, right, Elaine? Somebody here gave us this uh, and and meant we wanted you to have this. So, so, so somebody loved you so much, Miles, that they got rid of this from their own house and wanted you to have it. Okay, there we go. Congratulations, buddy. Back over here. Uh, Where are we, Henry? All right, so this is more of the predestined side. 
how and who. Hey guys, let's not touch that real quick. Let's, Wallace, let's wait on that, okay? Because we, it's all on together. Just a second. Thanks, guys. Go ahead. So who and how did predestination like come about? Yeah. Okay, so Henry's question is about a theological system that's often called the Reformed side of things. No, first of all, I'm not an expert on that. There may be people here who know more than me. This is a very sh brief thumbnail sketch. Um, the, the, the strong emphasis of this comes out of uh, that, where is that? We're even, we're even hearing that. Poor, poor, I'm sorry, Miles. You didn't mean to do that, but you can't turn it off either. It's gonna go on forever. Would you step, <laughs> would you step back a little bit? I think it's maybe his left foot that you push. Or maybe his left arm. <laughs> Whoever gave this, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. Um, there's a long history, but, but basically after the Protestant Reformation, um, people really wanted to make sure they understood things the right way. And there's a particular branch of it started by a guy named John Calvin and then people who were kind of his disciples just really worked through it. And they really wanted to make sure that Henry, you didn't think that you did anything to deserve being saved by God. You did nothing to deserve it. It's purely an act of God's grace. And they're a little bit worried that if we talk about how it's God's grace, but Henry, you still have to um, live obediently as a result of that grace. It almost might seem as if you get the credit and not God. And so it's a lot of it is out of a desire to make sure that God gets all the credit. I totally behind that. I have no objection with that at all. I think what I would say, I'm not from that tradition, so obviously it's not what I ultimately think is full expression of the truth. The apostle Paul and Jesus himself have no problem with this tension between saying it's 100% an act of God and you better respond to it. So because the apostles are comfortable with that tension, I'm okay living in that tension. I will say though, um, I don't think the scripture teaches that God has predestined groups of people for salvation or damnation from before the beginning of time. However, that doesn't get us out of the deep mystery of God's hand. So here's what I mean, Henry. Why were you born to the parents you were born to in a believing home and somebody else wasn't? Why did I have that coach or you had that piano teacher or that grandmother? Why were you brought to this church or that person to that church? And so no matter how you slice it, there are deep mysteries about the way that we come to faith that has to go with God's work in our lives. And I'm just personally saying oh, I'm comfortable living in that tension, but it is the case that God is ultimately at work and we don't totally understand all, every side of it. That's a very brief answer, good question. And I'm trying to be fair to the Reformed tradition, which is not ultimately where I come out of. And the reason, the reason this matters, Henry, is because of what we talked about tonight. The problem in the American church is a lack of holy living, a lack of faithfulness, a lack of persevering to the end. And so it actually does matter to emphasize what Paul says in Romans 11. Um, note then the severity and the kindness of God, the severity toward those who have fallen and the kindness toward you, comma, provided that you continue in faith. I think we've got to just keep telling our church, not to make our church scared, not scared about our salvation status. Christ, it, it, we st what do we sing in the song? Um, um, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, you're safe in his hands, but Christ has more for me. It's not an obligation, but this great adventure I get to keep pushing on for. Okay, Henry, long answer to your question. What do I got for you here, my friend? Oh, man, we got such weird stuff. Um, all right, this... Okay, it looks like a regular old drink. This is cantaloupe sodas, cantaloupe sodas. You can share those with your family. All right, over here. All right, Nora, do you wanna ask a question, young lady? Do you, can you help her, Miles, can you lift her up? Yes. What does joyful mean? What does what mean? What does joyful mean? I don't quite understand, I'm sorry. What does joyful mean? Is yeah. the question. Do you know what it means when you eat a lot of like food and you feel full? You ever felt full? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite food, Nora? Ice cream. Ice cream, me too. Love it. So I love ice cream. But have you ever had too much ice cream that you're like, I'm so full? Have you ever done that? Maybe, maybe not. 
Well, when you get older, you can eat too much ice cream, and then you're really full of ice cream. So to be joyful is to have so much joy that you're just filled with joy. You're just happy all the time, and you want to tell people about it. That's a good question. All right. I don't know if I really have gifts that are appropriate for you, uh, Nora. Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to give you that. That's definitely not a foot roll out. <laughs> How about, um, okay, this is okay. This is a, a um, basil seed drink with lychee flavor. Okay? So you can have this. And Nora, you don't have to drink this, okay? Just give it to your mom or your dad and make them do it. All right. Back, up, back over here. Yeah, Jack. Uh, does God see believing Jews and believing Gentiles differently? Or, like, does he look at them the same? The question is, does God see believing Jews and believing Gentiles? He sees them the same because what makes you part of the covenant people is confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. So just to prove it again, turn to Romans 10. Romans 10, everybody. Look how, look how Paul puts it. Romans 10, verse 12. Romans 10, 9 is the center verse about believing. Look, look at Romans um, uh, 10, 11. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Romans 10, 12, look, Jack, to answer your question, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches who all will call on him for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So there's no distinction. And that's a really important point for Paul's ministry, that it's for everybody. All right, let's see, let's see what I wanna give you here. Well, okay, this is nice, this is nice. This is grass jelly. Grass jelly, can we get that? And this is easily portable. You can see that, you can take that with you. There you go. Don't shake it up, it'll explode. All right, back over here. Wallace, do you have a question? Or who's next? One of y'all go, it's okay. After the first sin, God said that a boy will kill the serpent. Yeah. But does the Bible tell who kills the serpent, or is it a prophecy for when Jesus destroys Satan? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you for asking that, Wallace. I really like that you're connecting with the Old Testament to the New Testament. So Genesis 3.15, in Genesis 3.15, this is after they eat the apple and God has the consequences, and he says to the serpent, um, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and you, yours. Uh, he will strike your head and you will um, bite his heel. That's what it says, Genesis 3.15. It's a messianic prophecy about the Messiah. So imagine you're reading along and like you, you've never read the Bible and you're like, is this guy the guy that's gonna do it? Is this guy this guy? Is it gonna be Moses? Is it gonna be David? Is it gonna be Solomon? And each time you're disappointed. And then you finally get to Jesus. And Jesus is the one who steps on the serpent's head, but he himself was wounded in the process. So Jesus defeats death by how? By dying. So it's a messianic prophecy about Jesus all the time. The whole story of the Old Testament is waiting to see how Genesis 3.15 will come to pass. That's a really good question, Wallace. Do you need a follow-up to that? You look like you're thinking. Okay. All right. Wallace, you're my buddy, and I, I like you. So this is cuttlefish jerky with coconut water. So I cannot wait till you open this in the lunchroom tomorrow. There you go. Cuttlefish jerky. You didn't think you'd hear that at church tonight. Okay. Back over here. Yes, sir. Okay, so in chapter 11, verse 17, it says, but if some of the branches were broken off and you all, though a wild olive shoot, were grafted among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, does that mean they can't go back since they were broken off? That's a great question. Um, first of all, uh, Everybody over the age of 18. Um, how great is it that our kids are asking questions? And that's great. And they're like, they're like digging in. I mean, this is a great question. So um, I'm gonna give you a quick response. I think this is an example where I wouldn't push the word picture that Paul makes too far. I wouldn't push it too far. I don't, with every, because, skip down to verse 1123, look what it says in 11, um, um, not 1123, 1122. I quoted this several times. Note then the kindness and severity of God, 
Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. So Paul's warning to the Gentiles is that just because you're now part of the living branch doesn't mean you can't be removed from it. So, so that would sort of imply you could go back to, to being in a state of unbelief. It's, so I think you could, yeah. He's just warning them. Uh, and, but guys, this is really important. We don't need to walk around like worrying. I'm like, am I gonna lose my faith? So let me give you an example. So I'm supposedly kind of, sort of every now and then kind of trying to eat healthy, okay? And what happens when you eat healthy? If you eat healthy for a while, then you kind of continue in it. And if one day you're like, forget it, it's like, you know, it's all cheeseburgers and milkshakes all day long. One day isn't the problem, but what happens? You kind of go the next day, you know what? I enjoyed those cheeseburgers. And then you have it two days and three days. And after like six or seven days, you know what you don't want anymore at all? The healthy food, right? That's just human nature. It's how everything else works. When you're in a rhythm of good habits, you gotta keep going. So it's not like, it's not like one day you're caught up in sin or, or you're with bad friends or you stop going to church that you like stop believing. But the way the human heart works is that like, th- then I'm kind of disobedient over here and I stop going to church over here and I'm hanging out with the wrong kind of people over here and I'm kind of cutting corners on my job over here. And, and, and then all of a sudden, 10 years later, I look back and I realize that like, I have no faith at all. I don't care about God. I don't need God. I don't believe in his mercy. That's, that's how unbelief works. It's a slow, gradual thing, which is why the habits we cultivate, the disciplines are so important. So you don't have to work around afraid you're gonna misplace faith. It doesn't work like that. But you do have to make sure you persevere in the grace in which you were saved and just keep going. Great question. I don't know your first name. I'm sorry. No, no, not you. Sorry, behind, Decker. Declan, 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 Declan. Declan, Declan, let's see what we got here. I got, I got a drink for you, man. Tamarind drink. You ever seen the tamarind seed pods? Can we get a close-up on that? There we go. That's what it looks like. It's like those big seed pods, and it's a drink out of it, and uh, good luck. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Back over here. Yes, ma'am. So I don't really know how to put this, but in the beginning, God made everything. Mm-hmm. So, like... Let's just say a rainstorm, for example. It comes and it happens. Does God like make everything happen or does he only intervene whenever he wants something to happen or not happen? Yeah, Uh, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think think the, uh, Thomas Aquinas would say both, it's both. That God has set up certain physical laws and the laws work with condensation and evaporation and rain clouds and static electricity and all the stuff we learn in school. And that's because God set that in motion. So God has already set everything up to work a certain way, but he's not a watchmaker who's wound it up and he stepped back. His presence is still holding everything. If God's not holding each raindrop, the raindrops just cease to exist. So God has set it all up and he's there. But because God has that kind of care for it, he's also able to work within it to work all things for good for those who love God. So God has both set up the physical laws that allow the rainstorms to happen. He's also holding the raindrops together and he is intervening in what we might also call miraculous ways to bring rain when it's necessary at different times. So it's kind of all the above all together. And our lives work the same way. So for example, I'm a father and God used my body to bring my children into the world with my wife when we're married and we came together in one flesh. Um, and I was free for that act, but God also made me for that, but also the very act of life, conception, is a gift from God as well, so it's all kind of caught up together. Is that helpful at all? It's probably a deep mystery. You gotta kind of keep chewing on that. Great, tell me your name. Rachel. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Rachel, let's see what I got for you here, my friend. This is, okay, this is good, this is good. This is saying you should play with your food. It's the mug with a hoop. And you're meant to put like marshmallows and hot chocolate in them. See what I mean? So there you go. It's perfect for Christmas. Maybe even for re-gifting to somebody else. There you go. Okay, Christian, Christian. Yes. Okay, so I have a weird question, so bear with me. Um, so do you believe that like demonic forces still exist on the earth today? Absolutely, the question is okay. do, are there demonic forces? 100% for sure. Dark spiritual powers, yeah. So to add to that, um, I believe it's either Genesis 5 or 6, talks about the Nephilim. Uh-huh. Uh, a pastor, I believe it was last week, spoke to us at school and talked about 
how he believes the Nephilim are actually the demons that we experience today mm -hmm. because their souls have nowhere to go once they die. Have you heard this theory and what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, th th great question. Uh, yeah, so you, you're, you're asking, it's really in uh, Genesis 6 is what you're talking about. Um, uh, very, very, very brief, short answer is what's happening in Genesis 6 is that there is a line erased between the spiritual creatures and the earthly creatures. That line is transgressed, and that's why God brings the flood, among other reasons. There's something that's, there's disobedience happening there. Just as there's a fall among the people in Genesis 3, there's like a spiritual fall among the spiritual creatures here, okay? Um, do I think that's where modern dem demonic things come from? I don't think I would say that exactly. I think... I think it's related, there's a spiritual, f let me put it like this, let me wrap it up like this, Christian, as I'm on the spot here. What's happening in Genesis six is a result of spiritual rebellion and the signs of spiritual rebellion are still all around us. Is that helpful at all? We can talk about that maybe more offline. Great, great question. All right, Christian, all right, oh my gosh. This is, um, I don't actually know, oh, here it is. It's black sweet corn. Uh, I don't know if it's pickled, I don't know if it's sweet, I don't know what it is, but you're gonna have fun at lunch tomorrow at school, there you go, buddy. There you go. Let's see, maybe Jeremy, real quick, you have a quick question? Yeah. Okay. So in verse, in chapter 11, verse 11, what is Paul trying to say here in verse 11? <clears throat> yeah, so I ask, 11, 11, did they stumble in order that they might fall? No. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Paul says, um, is the fact that the Jews believed the end for them? Paul says, no. First of all, God is using their unbelief to bring in the Gentiles, and God has not yet given up on his people. So Paul's just saying, it's not, they're not, we don't want to give up hope on praying for the conversion of the Jews to Jesus Messiah. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful? Here, Jeremy, I'll hook you up. All right. These are peanuts and soy sauce. Okay, so I don't know. They, might, they don't look good, but, uh, you know. Uh, all right, Bo, you're going to bring it home. Real rapid-fire question, because I got one more gift. How do we understand the mystery that God is omniscient and is not surprised by anything, but yet he changes his plan according to the decisions of his people? How, how do we reconcile that, that God would know what's going to happen? Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, these are ultimately outside. We think in only finite terms, but I guess it would say, Bo, it'd be like I knew where you were gonna place your X's and O's, but I still let you do it. You're still free to do it, but I just know what you're going to do, and then I respond accordingly, something like that. I mean, it's a deep, it's a deep tension. Last one here, everybody else stand up, but Bo, look what I got for you, my buddy. I have you whole quail eggs in water. <laughs> whole quail eggs in water. Don't say I do nothing for you, all right? There you go. Hey, listen, everybody. Why does all this matter? I'm gonna preach on this on Sunday, but let, let me tell you why all this matters. If God is so powerful that he is going to use the hard-heartedness of his chosen people as a way to bring in the others, the nations, the Gentiles, into faith in Jesus, then God can do anything. If God can use the death of his son to bring salvation, if God can turn death into life and evil into good, he can do anything. You know why that's relevant? Can I just tell you? It doesn't matter in the long term what happens in the election. God is working all things for good. So if the person you want to win wins, if the person you don't want to win wins, if you don't want anybody to win, if you want both of them to win, then there's really something wrong with you. You know, whatever it is, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay, because God is at work. He's working all things for good. And, and we in the church ought to wake up every morning just thinking, I cannot wait to see how God's saving purposes are gonna be revealed to me today. And we ought to keep praying and going until he calls us home. So here's our closing prayer tonight. This is Romans 16, 25. It's the end. We're gonna get there on the day after Thanksgiving. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed to us 
to the prophetic writings that have been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the reading of Romans, as difficult as it is, bring you life. And may the grace of God thereby be revealed and released in your life. Amen. Happy Wednesday. I'll see you Sunday morning.